Good morning, Your Honors. The matter before the court this morning is the case entitled In Re Petition of Conservation Law Foundation, docket number 2017-162. Representing the Conservation Law Foundation is Sandra Levine. Representing the appellee, Vermont Gas Systems, is Craig Nolan, and representing the appellee, Department of Public Service, is Daniel Burke. Okay, thank you, counsel. Good morning, Your Honors. Good morning. May it please the court, I'm Sandra Levine. I'm the rep representing Conservation Law Foundation, the appellant in this proceeding. I'd like to reserve two minutes of time for rebuttal. That is gonna be up to you, but we're happy for you to do it. Thank you. This case concerns the Vermont Gas Pipeline in Addison County, Vermont. More specifically, it concerns the Public Utilities Commission rule for reevaluating a proposal when a significant change occurs. As this court knows, the Vermont Gas Pipeline is a large energy project. Large energy projects are reviewed by the Public Utilities Commission, which must make a determination about the overall value of the project, its environmental impacts, and whether or not the project will promote the general good of the state. The project was first reviewed by the Public Utilities Commission in 2013. At that time, the estimated cost of the proposal was $86 million. Six months later, in July of 2014, the estimated cost of the proposal jumped to $121 million. And six months after that, the estimated cost of the proposal jumped again to $153 million. During the same time period, other energy supplies, including cleaner renewable resources, became more available and their costs decreased. These changes in the energy markets, combined with the cost increase for the pipeline, significantly lessened the overall value of the pipeline proposal. Fortunately, the Public Utilities Commission has a rule to address this very matter, and it provides a common sense solution. Where circumstances significantly change, a reevaluation is required. Conservation Law Foundation is asking this court to require the Public Utilities Commission to follow its own rule. So isn't the issue here not whether a reevaluation is, is called for, but whether the mechanism, whether the rule that you say they should follow actually says what you say it says, or whether the Rule 60B process is the more appropriate process to review changes, not in the terms of the certificate, but in the underlying considerations that led to its award in the first place? Certainly both the Rule 60B process, a remand proceeding, and the amendment process exist side by side. The Commission knew that when the Commission established the rule, the Commission wrote the rule, the Commission wrote the rule, following an earlier proceeding regarding the, um, the a Velco transmission line where there was also a significant cost increase. So it knew about the issue of cost increases and how those will be reevaluated. It then wrote the rule which allowed for and provided clearly that um, significant changes will be subject to an amendment proceeding. So when you're talking about the regulatory history, and, and I'm hoping you can, one of the things I'm struggling with, is that I look at the regulatory history that was provided in the supplemental printed case, and it looks like this, this 5.408 and 5.409 in the current language as separate distinct pieces was proposed by the Department of Public Service with an explanation that it was intended to mean exactly what they say it means now. Um, you're saying it means something very different. The board adopted that, and the only comment the board made when it adopted that is we're, we're accepting their comments and their proposal, which might suggest that they understood it to mean what the proponents said it was going to mean. The, the board adopted it and acknowledged that we will uh, deal with the co with they, they didn't specifically call out cost increase as part of a significant change. They said we just, it is part and parcel of what is a significant change. Um, the, public, the starting point for, for this proceeding is the Public Utilities Commission rule itself. That rule sets forth when a new or amended permit is required. <clears throat> it specifically states that an amendment for a certificate of public good, quote, shall be required for a substantial change in the approved proposal. Rule goes on to state what a substantial change is, and it describes that as any change in the approved proposal that has the potential for a significant impact with respect to any of the statutory criteria or the general good of the state. So what is, if I can interrupt you please, what, what is uh, our standard of review here 
with respect to the, I'm going to call it the board, I know the name was changed, but it's still a little bit hard to get around that, um, with respect to the board's interpretation of its own rule uh, under these circumstances. Certainly, the appellees wrongly claim that the Public Utilities Commission decision is entitled to deference. This court has clear and very thoughtful precedent that laid out most notably in the 2006 case of Levine versus Wyeth, which was later affirmed by the United States Supreme Court. It's clear there that no deference. That. I'm well aware of that, <laughs> <laughs> as you may know. It's clear there that there is no deference where the meaning of the rule or statute is clear on its face. Here, there's no deference for pure issues of law, and the, and the determination of the meaning of, of a rule or statute is an issue so of you, law. So you're, you're, you're arguing, aren't you, that there's plain language here, and that and that that is that's what controls. But what exactly is the plain language that you're you're pointing to? Uh, that's clear on its face. The, plain, the rule states that a, um, an amendment shall be required for a substantial change in the approved proposal. And then it goes on to describe what a substantial change is, and that is a change that has the potential for a significant impact. So, it's signif so is it significant impact that, that you're saying is plain and, and evident on its face? It, there's two parts to it. First is, is there a change in the proposal? Okay. And um, the estimated cost is an aspect of the proposal. It was evidence that was submitted by the, um, by the applicant to the Public Utilities Commission. They relied on the cost of the proposal in determining whether this project had value relative to other energy supplies going forward. There was a change. There was a change in the, val in the estimated cost in 2013 than there compared to 2014, six months or a year later. Isn't the language that's really at issue is what is an approved process, another, um, another a proposal? In other words, the application might uh, indicate the costs, but the board doesn't actually approve the cost in an approved proposal. Certainly the board does not specifically approve the cost, but it approves the overall project. It approves the proposal. It has to make decisions regarding each of the Section 248 criteria including the environmental impacts, the economic impacts, and whether the project will promote the overall public, will promote the, the, the general good of the state. In doing so, it necessarily relies on the estimated cost of the project. How else can it determine the economic benefits, and how else can it determine the long-term value of this proposal compared to other energy sources that it will be competing with? What is the, t what is the test that you're arguing for here when we're looking at the issue of cost alone as potentially being a significant change. Uh, is there a percentage? Are you adopting the test out of uh, 5.409? What, what are you asking for here? Uh, <clears throat> the rule itself identifies wh what sort of changes, and including cost changes, would be significant. Those are changes that would have the potential to affect the, the outcome as to any of the criteria, determination as to any of the criteria. <clears throat> Certainly that doesn't cover de minimis changes, and there's a number of cases concerning that. Um, I think common sense would say that when the cost of a, of a proposal nearly doubles, it's appropriate to step back, take a look. Does, this, does continuing on this course of action, can, it, it, will it continue to be appropriate when the cost nearly doubles? It's not just the cost, it's not just the number of the estimated cost, but what are the ra what's the ramifications of that cost? What, will the, what energy supplies will this pipeline replace? Will it simply be replacing other fossil fuels, oil, which is what, they, uh, which is what was argued um, at the Public Utilities Commission? Or going forward, is it going to repl be replacing other cleaner, lower carbon um, energy supplies. And that's important. This is a pipeline that will be in place for somewhere between 50 and 100 years. Vermonters certainly have the, um, the right to rely on decisions of the Public Utilities Commission to know that the projects that are approved make sense over the long term, make sense over the life of the project. And that's exactly what was not reviewed and what was not allowed to be reviewed because the amendment was not uh, permitted to go forward. But wouldn't, wouldn't you concede you've been heard on this very issue? In other words, wasn't this case pending and then it was remanded because the 60B hearing was going forward and your concerns that you're raising about the costs were heard there, were they not? No, they weren't. Certainly the, uh, the other reviews do not uh, replace the need for the amendment proceeding. 
This I'm data. not asking you whether it replaces it, but I'm asking you, would you concede that your concerns on this issue that brings you here today have been heard? No. The um, Public Utilities Commission considered a remand proceeding. I think they they, there was a remand proceeding. The standards and the burdens of proof are different in those two proceedings. And the, the remand proceeding was a far narrower proceeding. Um, there were limitations as to what was being compared for, um, for th this project uh, versus other energy supplies. Um, certainly some of the evidence may overlap between the two proceedings, um, but in, in an amendment proceeding, it is the applicant who has all the access to the information, who is required to come forward and demonstrate that its project continues to be justified. Conversely, in a remand proceeding, it's other parties who are required to come forward, they don't have the evidence, and demonstrate that a different result would be likely. Those are very different standards. It's far more onerous to, uh, the remand standard is far more onerous. And the amendment appropriately recognizes that it's up to the applicants to demonstrate the continued viability of their project going forward. The applicant certainly had full notice of the requirement that, a, um, that an amendment may be sought. It chose not to seek an amendment, and it cannot now claim hardship for its own failure to do so. I next want to address the practical but, effect. But on yes. that, that issue of the remands, there weren't any appeals from the decisions of those remands. Were those, are those considered final orders? Those are final orders on the remand proceeding, yes, but they do not replace the request for an amendment, the requirement that the Public Utilities Commission rule has a process in place that an amendment um, is needed when there are su substantial changes to, to a project. Can I, one of the, the changes, you've cited two changes, and one has to do with the costs, and I, that I get more intuitively. The notion that changes in the market can require somebody to come back, I mean, aren't these projects often long-term projects that require a fair amount of investment? And is it, is it your position that a project that made economic sense at the time uh, and, and the investments have been made and, and you can come back and say, no, now you've got to reopen it because the market has changed? Those two changes work in tandem in, in, in this case, in, the, in this proceeding. You know, one without the other might not, um, might not present the need for an amendment. That's not what's before this court today. But certainly when those two matters are combined, the cost is a change in the proposal. If you're building a house or putting a new roof on your house and a contractor shows up with a proposal to do the work for X amount of dollars, and then a week later shows up and says, oh, it's 2X, sorry about that. That is a change in the proposal. And that's specifically what the, the rule states. A change in the proposal, if it's significant, requires an amendment. So in a remand proceeding, and I understand the standards and burdens are different and that that's a significant reason why it's important you to have this alternate process. But, but in the remand proceeding, they would still consider, the board would, the commission would still consider um, what the new reported actual costs are going to be relative to what they thought they were and any market changes and whether that would uh, undermine its uh, finding of public good that, that under, I mean, those considerations are all still at the core of its review, aren't they? They can be. But the you know, Public Utilities Commission can manage that, that process. It can, depending on wh what time horizon it will look out, and will it compare um, the differences in energy supplies going out five years, 10 years, 20 years, or for the life of the project. Um, the statutory criteria are clear as to what is, that the, the proposal needs to promote the general good of the state over the lifetime of the project, and that was not considered. Again, um, just in, to, to find to, the last issue is the practical effect, and I certainly recognize that this pipeline has been built, um, th but and a, a, re a new evaluation does not change that fact on the ground. However, a new evaluation could impose additional conditions. It could ad certainly address and remedy, or at least mitigate, the higher costs of the project as to what the cost recovery would be. It could also increase investment in cleaner energy supply or limit the use of the project to simply replacing um, higher carbon fossil fuels going forward. In conclusion, this court should reverse the Public Utilities Commission decision and require the Vermont Gas Systems to seek a new or amended permit for its Addison National Natural Gas Pipeline project. Thank okay, you. thank you very much, Council.
Thank you. May it please the court. Good morning. Good morning. Craig Nolan for Vermont Gas Systems. The issue before the court is very narrow. It's whether the PUC committed compelling error by interpreting its own rule, 5408, to apply to physical changes consistent with PUC and Act 250 precedent. That's the issue before the court. The Chief Justice, I believe, asked about the standard, standard of review. Of review. Yeah, I'd like to hear what you have to say about that. And, and the standard of review here is clear. It's been said time and time again, and that is the PUC, as an administrative agency, is, uh, is entitled to substantial deference with regard uh, to its interpretation of rules it promulgates pursuant to authority vested in it by the legislature. Deference. This court has expressed uh, that deference standard in different ways, uh, and that has included compelling error, whether they have committed compelling error. And there was no compelling error here in the commission's interpretation of its own rule. We've had discussion already this morning about that rule. There's a phrase, approved proposal. Uh, the commission uh, explained exactly what that means. It's the project. The commission has very clear in its opinion, it did not approve the cost or cost estimate of this project. In the, but it considered it. It did, Your Honor. Yes, it did. So what is the purpose of Rule 5.409, which I characterize as a monitoring rule, that when the costs, project costs skyrocket, well, actually, it says project increases by 20%. What's the purpose of that if not to require an amendment to the initial proposal? So uh, 5409 uh, was proposed originally by the department, and you'll hear later from the department. But 5409 <coughs> was proposed in combination with 5408. They were adopted together. The purpose of 5409, it's a safety valve. It requires a utility to notify the commission when cost estimate has increased by 20%. The question is, where do you go from there? You, the legislative history has been discussed. Uh, it was originally proposed uh, by the department that there would be an explicit provision in 5409 that the commission would reopen the proceeding. That's different than seeking an amendment. And what happened here uh, was exactly that. With it, the commission's request for the remand. Right. The, the commission twice requested this court to remand the case uh, so that it could consider under Rule 60 uh, whether to reopen. And uh, So, but that, this takes me to this flip side of the question I asked your colleague, right? Because this came from the department. They explained that, that the reason for this disclosure was so that you could have a, you could then go back and reopen under 60B. And, mm -hmm. And uh, they specifically included language in their proposal that specified that. But then the board, now commission, s said we adopt their proposal, but actually didn't keep in the reopening language, which then creates, uh, I guess, an ambiguity as to whether it was intended to reject that and, and have this be an, a provision that augments 408 by providing, requiring notice, or? We don't think there's any ambiguity here uh, for a couple reasons. One. Uh, the commission, then the board, uh, did not adopt all the language proposed by the department. Instead, it reserved to itself uh, maximum discretion in how to handle these situations. Um, if, if 5409, the, the, the reporting requirement, were intended to fold into an amendment process that's described in 5408, 5409 would have been part of 5408. Well, you just told us it was igni ignited, enacted at the same time. They, they weren't, but they are enacted as separate proposals. They work in tandem, but it was not enacted as part of that. And there is no, uh, there is no cross-reference that if there is more than 20%, then the board will determine whether to proceed no, it doesn't say that. I realize that, but I just don't see the point of that statute if it doesn't do anything other than initiate a review through an amendment process. I mean, the, 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 the commission 
The purpose is so that the Commission is aware that cost estimates have increased by 20 percent, so that the Commission can then take the appropriate action. Which it, is? Which is, it can open an investigation, or like it did here, rightly so, it can uh, commence uh, a proceeding under Rule 60. And why Rule 60? Because although there's one process here, uh, we have two different outcomes of the 248 proceeding, two different uh, documents. We have a CPG. That CPG uh, authorizes the approved proposal. And what is that approved proposal? The CPG is very clear. It is 41 miles of pipeline, several distribution mains, and three gate stations. That's what the CPG is. It is a construction permit. It has some conditions, as many permits do, such as obtain all permits. On the other hand... But beyond a construction permit, it, it, the CPG is a certificate of public good. So there's a consideration that's folded in that doesn't just look at zoning permits and building options. That's right. We're not simply looking at whether it's a purple pi pipeline and that's going to be aesthetically okay. Um, no. There is a decision, a final order, a judgment issued by the Commission, separate from the CPG. That final order, that judgment, that decision uh, uh, makes a determination and authorizes, in this case, a CPG. Isu authorizes the issuance of the CPG, the permit. And the cost estimate of the project is considered under Section 248, of course, but it's not approved. The pipeline's approved, but the cost item is considered in whether to issue the permit, the CPG, authorizing the pipeline. Who has, the, who has the burden in a 60B proceeding? The movement has the burden. All right, but you control the information concerning costs. Well, uh, Your Honor, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. Uh, in this particular case, there were two remands that resulted in two extensive proceedings. The, uh, both involved hearings before the Commission, both involved testimony before the Commission. The second proceeding, the second remand, lasted approximately a year, during which there was significant discovery. So in any dispute, the uh, one party or the other may have the information, but there was an opportunity uh, for discovery. And of course, the Public Service Board, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the, the Public Service Department was involved as well. <clears throat> so there was plenty of opportunity here. I think fundamentally the difference is we have a CPG here that's about physical changes. The legislative history supports that. The jurisprudence supports that. And the commission uh, interpreted its own rule in a rational manner. But then my question is, this, the Commission said uh, Section 248 proceedings involve review and approval, approval of the construction of proposed facilities, not the approval of the recovery of construction costs from ratepayers. Costs are going to be recovered only after a utility files for a rate adjustment, demonstrating construction costs are known and measurable and that the construction facility is used and useful. So under this standard where there's no amendment to a proposal for a CPG, you come in and you estimate the cost of my new windmill is going to be $100 and it becomes $900. And now are, are you actually going to impose that increase on the ratepayers because it happened? Well, the, the short answer is no. Uh, you're going to see in the next few months the appeal from the heavily litigated rate case uh, in which the company sought to recover its construction costs up to a limit. And so as the, uh, as the Commission pointed out, that is yet uh, uh, another avenue uh, where costs are considered and approved to the extent that they are recovered from ratepayers. So, uh, CLF was asked, uh, haven't you been heard? They've been heard three times. They were heard in the first remand, 
They didn't appeal that decision. They were heard in the second remand. They didn't appeal that decision. And they were heard uh, extensively during the rate case that will soon be in this courtroom. Uh, so they've been heard on this issue. This, uh, this is an argument that says we want yet another bite at the apple. This has been litigated, they've been heard, and uh, the, the board or the commission has used the appropriate mechanism. Uh, but Vermont Gas Systems is not going to be held to its original estimate of costs when it goes before the PUC to look at the rate, uh, the, uh, forgetting my terminology, the um, recovery of, uh, you, a rate, rate, rate recovery? Rating. Yeah. Yes. It's not going to be held to the initial cost estimate when it goes back, right? The commission uh, had uh, complete discretion uh, to determine what rates, uh, what, how much of the project would be recovered through rates based on uh, used in usefulness uh, and based primarily on prudence, uh, prudence? On, on prudence, which is something I don't want to go into today, but essentially there was a, a, a significant examination of management's performance and a determination by the commission as to what monies were prudently spent. And I'll go back to the remands. During the remands, the commission could have looked at the estimate increase and decided we're gonna reopen this thing, we're gonna decide whether or not we should, uh, whether or not we should authorize this by looking at all, uh, all, all the factors that was a mess. <laughs> you can answer that if you want, but I'd like you to do it on speakerphone. Right? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. See, I, I saw Ms. Levine use her uh, well, phone. Join in. That didn't work out so well for me. Yeah, that's her. But th there was an opportunity to put the brakes on this project if it wanted to during the first remand and the second remand. This project has been scrutinized multiple times uh, and CLF has had all of its issues and concerns reviewed. At this well, point, each of those, each one of those is, a, I mean, I, it deals with the pipeline, but in the rate process, it sounds like the standard that's being applied doesn't really ask the question of whether this project, given costs and benefits, is in the public interest. It asks, you could, you could uh, wrongly predict the costs but then have ultimately spent way more than you said you were going to spend, but have done so prudently. So, you know, you pass it on to the ratepayer, but it's still not a project that w would have been in the public interest in the first place. I don't know how... You know, Justice Robinson, what I would say is this, is that the, the estimation process itself is subject to a review for prudence. Uh, and so uh, you, you, they, you get at that issue in the rate case, but during both remand one and remand two, uh, the commission could have determined that at that estimated cost, it was not in the public uh, in, this, in the public's uh, uh, best interest, that there was not an economic need for it, uh, and therefore it could have reopened and uh, modified or rescinded the CPG during either of those proceedings. And had CLF wanted uh, to uh, be heard in this court about those decisions, it had every right to appeal, okay, so but are, it did are not. Are you saying uh, that the only mechanism to challenge a cost increase is through a 60B proceeding and that the, the flip side of that coin is that increased costs can never trigger an, a, an amendment procedure under 5408 outside of the 60B review? Well, uh, Your Honor, a cost increase accompanied by a physical change. So we're going to... Uh, I understand the physical change sure. aspect, but you're... Standing you're, alone. Standing alone, it doesn't matter how much the cost increase, you don't get a 248, uh, a, a Rule 408 review for an amended procedure except through 60B mechanism. Well, you don't get it through 5408 because that is only looking at the approved proposal, which is the, the facility itself. You can get it through Rule 60 
because that's where cost estimates are considered. That's because they were considered under 248 through the 248 proceeding. Um, could, could the commission decide uh, it would use some other mechanism, uh, an investigation or some other sort of proceeding that was neither 548 requiring an amendment or Rule 60? Uh, they certainly have uh, broad discretion. They certainly could consider, uh, could consider promulgating a rule to that effect or mod modifying 5409 if it wanted to. But Rule 60 works because the cost considerations uh, were, uh, were analyzed in a proceeding that led to a final order, a final order that authorized the CPG. I have eaten up the department's time. I had promised them three minutes. Thank you very much. We got three minutes left? Mm -hmm. No, he has no time remaining. Yeah, oh, yeah, there's no, there's no time left. Thank you. Appellant Council? has 45 seconds remaining. All right, thank you very much. 45 seconds? Yes. <laughs> thank you, Your Honors. In the 45 seconds, I will just acknowledge that the appellees noted there is no ambiguity here. When there is no ambiguity, there is absolutely no deference that should be afforded to the determination made by the Public Utilities Commission. The rule is clear on its face, and Conservation Law Foundation is simply asking this court to require the Public Utilities Commission to follow its rule as written. Thank you. Thank you. The next hearing for the court is scheduled for 11 this afternoon or this morning. 11.